Hi, I'm Nicole Carlson, pronouns she, her. Uh, together with my coworker, Michael, we're going to tell you about our first collaboration together, where we built a multitask model to solve a product classification task at our company. Let's see. So, like Nicole mentioned, uh, my name is Michael, pronouns he, him, his. I'm a senior data scientist at ShopRunner, and I enjoy working on R&D type projects. Also enjoy doing things like drawing stick figures as part of presentations, and my medium profile says I'm a part-time house cat, but no one has actually commented on that. A typical quote from me is something, like, something along the lines of, uh, how can we have more shenanigans? Cool. Uh, like I said, my name is Nicole, pronoun she, her. I'm a data science manager at ShopRunner. Uh, I work pretty differently from Michael. I love making lists. I am super into refactoring code. And every single person on our team has had me ask, could you please alphabetize your imports in a pull request? Uh, so just a little bit of an outline of what we'll be talking about. So first we'll introduce you to the problem we were trying to solve, which was product attribute modeling. Uh, we'll discuss our initial multitask model. Uh, then we'll jump to the refactoring the code section which is obviously my section since I love refactoring. Uh, we'll talk about what happened when we tried to add a new attribute as well as discuss our final model. And throughout the presentation, we'll sprinkle in some lessons that we learned while collaborating with one another. Okay, so I'll dive into this next initial section where I'll give some background information on the project that Nicole and I were working on. We're doing product attribute modeling at ShopRunner. So, ShopRunner is an e-commerce company which partners with around 100 different retailers and we end up aggregating their product catalogs. And one of the main data science concerns we have is being able to sort of normalize the characteristics or attributes of these products across this aggregated catalog. So when we started this project, we basically scoped out and said, okay, we have this large list of attributes that we want to be able to predict, but we'll start with two. So we want to start with color and pattern. And basically for any given product in our aggregated catalog, we'll be able to say what their color and patterns were. And we, we wanted to expand, and from there quickly expand to a series of other attributes like dress length, sleep length. But for the purposes of this presentation, sort of the key one that we're gonna talk about is when you try to add in season. So for this initial pipeline or section of the project, we, we recognize that probably we can represent products as both their images or their text, but for now, we just want to focus on, focus on images while we recognize text is useful and we want to add it later. We basically take the image, feed it through a model, and be able to predict the like, color and pattern of that given product. So I'm going, to dive into, now I'm going to dive into kind of what our initial model and what that pipeline looked like. But first, I kind of want to go through what is multitask learning, what it is, and can you eat it? Sadly, no, you can't eat it. But I want to go, there, there's a couple of useful benefits for doing multitask learning. And the first one I'm going to illustrate with an example from the movie Karate Kid. And in the movie Karate Kid, you have this, uh, the Cobra Kai are these like group of schoolyard bullies. And essentially they're a, you can think of them as like single task networks. They learn karate as a form of violence and they can do that relatively well. But on the other hand, you have the Karate Kid. And the Karate Kid expected to be taught how to fight, punch, and like kick things when he went to go and train with Mr. Miyagi. But what Mr. Miyagi does is he teaches him these sort of additional tasks. And he teaches him how to wax a car, paint a fence, add a walkway, and so, such that when the karate kid does learn to fight, he's actually able to learn to fight at a like level equal to or better than the Cobra Kai, because he's sort of learned to do these multiple things simultaneously. And in multitask learning, what that materializes as is when you train a multitask network, you're, you should be able to get equal to or better performance than their single task counterpart because of sort of the the model has to learn the sort of like rich underlying feature set to solve all these tasks simultaneously. Then the second additional benefit we have from an industry point of view, it means that we have fewer models to maintain. So sure, we could we could solve a problem by building individual classifiers for each individual attribute we have, but that it, but that basically increases the burden on our team. So if we can train a single single model to kind of replace those three, it means that there's less for us to maintain and monitor infrastructure wise and less things for us to like debug over time. So I'm gonna go through to what the actual like architecture of this initial model looks like. And 
what happens is we feed in two images. The first one is a full image, and the second one is a center crop of that initial image. And essentially the idea here is that center crop is helping us inject some detailed con context into this model when we for the, that could be useful for like these uh, attribute classifications. So what happens first is we pass each, each image through this like core resident 50 architecture. We get their feature vectors and we concatenate them and then feed them through the sort of DETS network, which is then connected to these final uh, task heads, in this case, color and pattern. And this is a pipeline that we were able to build out pretty quickly and pretty straightforwardly because it's relatively in line with a lot of multitask learning literature. But our problem gets a little bit more, or starts to diverge, gets a little bit more specific because we, it's not just that we want to predict color and pattern, we want to predict all these additional attributes, so like season, dress length, and sleep length. And what standard multitask learning literature would have us do is maintain a single mon monolithic data set and basically use that for training our multitask model. But in this case, because we're adding it on iteratively, we could add a new task and then we kind of have to hope and pray that that task is well represented in the monolithic data set we're maintaining. If it's not, we have to go gather a new data set and then kind of mark both, uh, mark both data sets and merge them together, which is kind of a very time consuming, potentially expensive task to do over time. So I was kind of hoping to see, is there something else we could do? And what I came across was I was rewatching a, a lecture from Andrew Ning, who's discussing multitask learning. And he mentions kind of offhandedly that multitask learning also works if some of the images are only partially labeled or images or samples. And the idea here was that, okay, maybe we can get to something else where we don't have to mark every sample with every, like every image, every sample, everything else, but maybe we can get to a point where we have specific data sets which are marked for a specific task and use those to train those specific tasks. But this is a thing that I knew could probably be done because Andrew Ning mentioned it, but I didn't know how to get there. So it was a lot of research, uh, reading papers, blogs, tutorials, really anything I could find about multitask learning, implementing it in code, and then just failing for a long period of time. And just this iterating, this very vicious feedback cycle. And personally, for to like figure out this problem, it wasn't until like I was able to like successfully distance myself from the problem that I was able to figure out like kind of what I was doing wrong. And I realized this while I was doing a sparring session for Wing Chun Kung Fu, where I realized that I wasn't really setting up the pipelines in such a way that the model was getting explicit and clear feedback for like good classifications and mistakes it was making at any given point in time. So then, then I thought, okay, maybe if I can simplify or like make this feedback more explicit, it can actually learn. And of course, this happened while in a sparring session, so I kind of lost my focus, got punched repeatedly in the chest, but hashtag worth it because it had helped me figure out this uh, concept of multi data set multi task learning and essentially what happened what i like ended up thinking about was okay say we have these data sets which represent an individual task so we say we have two for, two for now but it can really be any number and what we do is we take these batches or data sets prepare their batches and kind of shuffle them together to this random grab bag and then what we start doing is we start drawing out one by one and feeding it through our model so say in this case, say we draw the color batch, we feed it through the model. The model is actually going to predict both color and pattern. But what we're only what we're going to do is only score it based on color because that's what we have the labels for in this case. And then we're going to use that for back propagation. On a future iteration, say we pick out a pattern batch, we feed that through. It's an output prediction for both color and pattern, but we only score the results from pattern and use that for back propagation. And then an epic in this training cycle ends when the last batch is sort of drawn out of this grab bag. And the end result here is that you have a model that has never seen a sample that has both color and pattern marked, but it can make good predictions for both of those tasks. So at the end of this initial R&D process, training on a relatively small data set and with this image only model, have we had color at about like 84% and pattern 82% which is fine and a good starting point. And we realized we'd get additional benefits when we added in text. So now it's over to Nicole to sort of add in that section of the model architecture. Uh, yeah, so this is when I joined the project. Uh, Michael was working on another piece of work at Shropunner and I was interested in joining the project because I hadn't had any deep learning experience before. And I thought I should work with the master, Michael, to figure out what was going on. So I was really excited, excited to uh, look at the code and figure out what was going on. And my initial goal for this type of this part of the project was to start using text. 
So we wanted to use both the images and the text of a product, like the name and product description, to predict those same tasks that Michael described before, color and pattern. So the specific model we ended up putting in for the text was a BERT model, uh, because Michael had experience with BERT models, so he had some existing code we could work off of. So uh, we still took in that same full image and cropped image and sent it through a ResNet. At the same time, we were sending through the product text through a BERT model. In both of these cases, we get some output vector, then we send them through the dense layers and then out again to the color and pattern task kit. So I knew what I was supposed to be doing. Uh, now I just had to get it implemented in code. So my first step was to read through all the work that Michael had done. Uh, as we mentioned previously, Michael works quite differently than I do. So he had all of his code in Jupyter Notebooks. Um, he had done a variety of rounds of training. So there was a lot of duplicate information in the notebooks, uh, along with his notes about what had happened with each learning rate, with freezing various parts, et cetera. So it was a lot for me to dig through. Um, and uh, as I was reading through it, I noticed uh, that there were a number of things that were um, repeated throughout the code. So um, there was this multi-attribute model, this train model function was copied a number of times. Uh, I also saw that there were a number of cases where Michael had hard-coded in the tasks themselves. So uh, there were references to color and to pattern within the, uh, within the model. Uh, the software engineer in me looked at this and said, hmm, I bet there's a way we can do this without hard coding in the tasks. And since we know we want to add additional tasks, uh, this will make it more flexible for us to work with this in the future. So as I was reading through these notebooks, as I was seeing this stuff, I decided to pull out the common code into Python scripts. Uh, I initially did this for myself because I thought it would help me understand what was going on with the training if I was able to separate out the parts that were repeated versus the parts that were different. So I went ahead and refactored all of the code. So I created a multi data set loader. Uh, this was to do the shuffling that Michael just mentioned of the different tasks. Uh, I created a ResNet for multitask classification. So this was uh, basically the model that Michael described earlier, where you have the ResNet and the different tasks head. And I created it so that it could work for an arbitrary number of tasks. And then finally, I also created a multitask learner uh, to do the training and validation. And this class took care of the uh, back propagation of the different losses for the different tasks. So uh, I was kind of all set up uh, and ready to, um, to start adding in the text. And since I already had the ResNet for multi -class, uh, multitask classification, it was relatively straightforward for me to figure out how to do the same thing for a BERT model. So I created a, uh, a text model for multitask classification, as well as uh, the ensemble model that would combine the BERT and ResNet outputs to the task heads. So I was feeling pretty good about this. Uh, I had some separated out code. I felt like I kind of understood what was going on better since I actually had uh, worked through some of the code myself and had these Python scripts. So I decided to train a uh, single task uh, for color and pattern using my ensemble image and text models. Uh, as you recall, I said that uh, the models would work for an arbitrary number of tasks. One is a number. So uh, I went ahead and did that. And for color, using image and text only, we got 95% accuracy. And for pattern, we got about 86% accuracy. I also thought it was really important for us to have a baseline because this would help us tell if our multitask model was actually working as well as we thought it could. Um, multitask models should do, ideally, about as well as uh, training each task individually. And sometimes they can even do a little bit better if the tasks um, work well together. So uh, having these single task models, I went ahead and trained the multitask model. And our multitask model got about 93% for color and 84% for pattern. Uh, you'll notice that this is a little bit higher than the image-only results that Michael got um, previously. So we felt good that the text was actually adding something to this project and was worthwhile. Um, and for our use case, the 2% drop in accuracy uh, was not super important because we could always set a threshold. So I was feeling great. I had refactored this entire code base. 
And uh, I had set, uh, met the goal that I'd set out to, which was to build an image and text model. Great. Wrong. Uh, I had been doing this all by myself, just heads down. And I did not tell Michael anything about what was going on. Uh, as you can see from this uh, pull request, I changed 33 files in his library and I was only supposed to be adding in text. So I had completely changed to this library and I didn't tell Michael at all was going on, which was a really shitty thing to do. So that brought us to our first lesson, uh, which was that it's super important to communicate with somebody, especially if you're gonna change their entire library. Nobody likes coming back to a pull request with 33 files. Uh, had I gone to Michael earlier and explained what I was trying to do, uh, he wouldn't have felt as blindsided uh, when I came back with all these changes. And uh, since he knew the code base a lot better, I'm sure he could have uh, given me a lot of tips along the way as I was uh, refactoring the code. Uh, another lesson that we learned is how important it is to make your collaborators feel valued. So during this time that um, we had this conflict, we actually each went to our boss and said, oh, I don't think I'm contributing enough. So I was like, oh, Michael did all the deep learning stuff. All he did was software engineering. It doesn't matter at all. Michael went to our boss and said, Nicole did all this refactoring. It's totally awesome. Like all he did was put in some neural networks. So we were both sitting there feeling conflicted, even though we were both respected each other a lot and were uh, deeply admirable of what the other person was doing. So if you get to a point like that, tell the other person what's going on. Uh, there's no downside and everyone will feel better. So once we resolved some of our conflict, uh, we had this library that was in a good place where we could add uh, new tasks onto our, our model. So uh, we decided it was time to add a new attribute. And the initial attribute we wanted to add was season. Um, so we were gonna take basically our same uh, model architecture that already had color and pattern and add season on. And just like uh, I had done previously, uh, the first step was for me to train a single task season image and text model, just so we could get a baseline of what we were working with. So uh, I, I trained that model and our season accuracy was about 86%. So I was feeling great. I know exactly how to train a multitask model, no problem. Wrong. Uh, as soon as we trained a multitask model, no matter what I did with the learning rates, the optimizers, whatever, the multitask accuracy stayed really low. So color was at about 89%, pattern was at 82%, season was all the way down at 74%. So something very bizarre was happening. Uh, and I also noticed that it was only happening with the ResNet. Uh, when I looked at just the text models by themselves, uh, the multitask model could do well, but the image only model or the ensemble model was just failing completely. So uh, I had no idea what to do, but then I thought, wait, I know someone who's very good at deep learning who might be able to shed some light on what's happening. See, yeah, so when Nicole contacted me about this problem, I was like, wow, what is even happening? Because in multitask learning literature, basically what, like, one of those main benefits that they like, mentioned frequently is that as long as you have this related domain of tasks, you should basically be getting equal to a better performance than their single task counterparts. So <clears throat> I was kind of, for a while, I was, quite, I was really at a loss and what it felt like was one of those like fairy tale or fantasy type tropes where you have to find the name of the creature in order to like beat or banish it. And so for me, it just became this like search through literature or basically pouring through everything I'd read about multitask learning, all the research papers, blogs, tutorials, really anything I could find looking for like references to the, something that has these symptoms. And big breakthrough came when I was rereading this one particular post out of a research group from Stanford but they mentioned kind of offhandedly that they have, they took certain steps to mitigate something that they called uh, destructive interference. And while they didn't say like what it was or like what exactly the problems it caused were, I was able to do further research from there and kind of figure out like, oh, the symptoms of destructive interference and multitask learning are kind of match what we're seeing here. So destructive interference is this idea brought from physics where it's like uh, opposite signals will cancel each other out. But in multitask learning, what they kind of use it to refer to is this idea where you have these multiple tasks which aren't really aligned with one another or aren't that related to one another as far as the neural network is concerned. So you might have this one task season and it's going to say, okay, you should go this direction in order to optimize to my problem space. 
And then the network will like, okay, sure, let's go in that direction. And then the other, the other task, say pattern color in this case, will say, okay, you should go this opposite direction or optimize to us. So what happens is you get this network that's kind of pulled back and forth in these conflicting directions, such that like it might look like it, it's converging on a solution, but what happens is it doesn't really learn to do any of the tasks particularly well, and you see the sort of drop off in performance and everything. So now that we had this like identified this problem, structural interference, knew the symptoms, and sort of knew what caused it, Nicole and I were at the spot where we could start doing, uh, training up our, I guess, final models and solutions to this problem. Yeah. So uh, once Michael mentioned this, um, I was super excited that we had a name for what was going on. And we immediately nerd sniped our entire data science team and sat in front of a whiteboard for an entire afternoon, throwing out whatever ideas we possibly had to try and solve this problem. So uh, one initial thought we had was, let's just give up on multi-task learning and have one single task, uh, one single model per task. Uh, we obviously didn't really want to do this uh, because we didn't want to maintain these many models. We didn't want to have all these different services to maintain. So uh, we pretty quickly scrapped that idea. Uh, another idea we discussed was having one model per related task group. So we had seen that color and pattern seemed to train well together and season uh, didn't. So maybe we separate things out that way. This was still not a very satisfactory uh, solution for us because uh, we knew anytime we added a new task, we'd have to train every single model uh, all the way through with the new task to figure out if it destructively interfered with an existing task or paired well. And that just seemed like way too much work. Uh, we also would have had uh, multiple models to maintain, which we, again, did not want to do. Uh, another pie in the sky idea we had was uh, to just have one ResNet per task. So I had mentioned that the interference only seemed to be happening with the ResNet. The BERT model seemed to be able to handle all the different complexities of the tasks. So one thought was, well, just leave the BERT model for all the tasks and have separate ResNets. Uh, we were also not very excited about this uh, because we knew that some of the tasks should train well together. And uh, some of them should be working on very similar tasks. So for example, dress length and sleeve length, uh, we're just, we need a model that can find a horizontal line in the picture. So it seemed really wasteful to have separate ResNets to find a horizontal line. So the final solution we came up with was to have one ResNet per related task group. So uh, we would have a color and pattern ResNet, which would combine with the output from the BERT model, and a season ResNet, which would combine with the output from the same BERT model, uh, sent off to the various task heads. So uh, we were very excited about this um, because we knew now we could get uh, tasks that train well together to, um, to get the benefits uh, of training together while still allowing the tasks that destructively interfered with one another to be separate from one another in the ResNet. So uh, I went through our code base and modified our ResNet architecture and our ensemble architecture to be able to handle this new complication of having an arbitrary of ResNets with an arbitrary number of tasks. But once I got that all set up, I was able to retrain the multitask model and our accuracies got way better. So our color accuracy went up to about 94%, pattern to 85%, and season was at 84%. So uh, we were super excited about this. And in fact, you can see that color and pattern are actually slightly better uh, than when it was just the color and pattern uh, ensemble by itself. So we're feeling really good. Uh, we had this new multitask library all set up. We knew we would be able to easily add um, existing uh, new tasks to existing models. And for me, the, this last uh, piece of work where we discovered this destructive interference was a, a really good reminder of how important it is to balance different work styles when you uh, work with somebody who uh, is very different from how you work. Uh, in this case, um, having Michael do a bunch of research and test a bunch of things in Jupyter Notebooks worked out really well when paired with my, um, my ability to kind of abstract things into classes and code and to really think through the software engineering side of things. So uh, I would say if you're collaborating with somebody else who works very differently from you, make sure you play to your strengths while at the same time still learning from one another. 
Yeah. So at this point, we felt pretty good about everything because we have this library, which is super cool, at least from our point of view. And it supports things like you can easily add in new tasks, you can have new model classes, and you have this like fun multi data set training functionality. We also found that our like the code base is nice and reusable because we had lots of our teammates who've actually taken user for both personal and other internal sharpener projects and found it to be like pretty straightforward to use and were able to get things up and running. And in addition to these things, Nicole and I are both pretty passionate about open sourcing and really this like idea of giving back to our community as a whole. So with all these things sort of like lining up together, our next steps were pretty clear. So what we did was we, we uh, open sourced our library called Octopod. And it is this uh, PyTorch-based multitask learning framework that we really built up for our like internal shop owner, like uh, attribute model use cases, but we found it to be extremely useful for a variety of things. So we just wanted to like put it out there in the community. And it supports things like the multi data set training we mentioned, multiple inputs, images, text, uh, of course, the multiple tasks. It's a core piece of the functionality. And then we have the ability to sort of tie together models very freely. So, like multiple resnets, ensemble, to make ensembles with text models, and kind of really any way you want to mix and match those. And then we also have things like multiple loss functions with the idea that different tasks might require like very personalized loss functions for those tasks. And so at the bottom here, we have the uh, GitHub and PyPI links for our Octopod repo. And then one other lesson that we have is that really it, it is like a super fun and rewarding experience to work with, uh, like for Nicole and I to work with someone who has opposite strengths from me, like ourselves. And really making this library together is something that once we figured out how to collaborate well together, it's something we were able to make something that really neither of us could have made on our own. And it kind of reinforced that lesson that how it's fun and rewarding to work with people which is very different from you because that's that that is really how you end up growing as a like software engineer, data scientist, just as a person, getting exposed to those new ways of thinking. So to wrap it up, uh, we'd like to give a quick shout out and thanks to the Shopper Data Science team for allowing us to repeatedly nerd snipe them and for all their support, and also for the guidance of our former manager, Ali Vanderbilt. Then we have the contact information for Nicole and myself, so my medium, medium handle and then Nicole's Twitter handle. And then once again, we have the links for the Octopod, GitHub, and IPI links.